Uh, my name is uh, Fernando Martí. I'm uh, co-director of the Council of Community Housing Organizations, known as Choo Choo. Uh, supervisor Kim mentioned, mentioned Choo Choo. Uh, we worked closely uh, with the supervisor on uh, last November's uh, uh, Proposition K, which is a public housing, public land uh, measure that was um, before voters and passed uh, uh, with 75% of the voters. Um, we are a, a small organization, we're a staff of two, but we're a coalition of 23 organizations, affordable housing developers and community advocates. Uh, and we often work uh, with the city, with the Mayor's Office of Housing, with the Planning Department, and we're often fighting the city, the same Planning Department and Mayor's Office of Housing on how they do their work. Um, so when uh, uh, Jody had contacted me about doing this, um, originally Planning Department was going to be presenting this affordable housing density bonus program, and I was going to present some questions that we have about this. Choo Choo has not taken an official position. We're going to, as a membership organization, we're going to be voting in January on a position on this. Uh, but as staff, we've raised a number of questions, which is the, uh, the piece that uh, we passed out to you that's got some, uh, I think some eight, seven questions um, that I think are, are some rather controversial, meaty questions about this proposal. Um, so first of all, I wonder how many folks have heard of the density bonus program? Uh, so four yeah. or five mm -hmm. folks. Um, so most of you have not, or maybe I'll, hi John. Um, and even just know a little bit. All right, so I'm going to try to do a brief question and a brief uh, review of it since there was going to be a counterpart from the city. Um, the city's been working on this for about two years. Um, they met with my organization a few times. Um, and part of this comes from a state law that is in existence um, called the, the State Density Bonus Law. Uh, that says that developers uh, anywhere in the state, if they uh, provide a certain number of affordable units, and the state law defines affordable at different levels, the developer can request and can get additional density. So when I say density, does, who can tell me what, what you think I mean by density? Crowdy. <laughs> uh, okay, when a, when a planner uses the term density, or when in the law, when we say density, what, what do, you, do you think that means upzoning? You can upzone, meaning you can change the density. So in most uh, suburban cities, and in most of San Francisco, we have what are called density controls. So if you've got a plot of land that is this big, you would look up under the planning code, and you'd say, this, this particular area is RH1. That's one housing unit for this lot of land. Or it might say one unit per 200 square feet. So you'd say here's 200 square feet and there's another 200 square feet. So you can put two units on this piece of land. That's, that's how density is usually defined. Now in San Francisco in the last uh, eight years or so, large parts of San Francisco, mostly on the east side, the city has gotten rid of density control, meaning that developers can build as high as the height limit. So there's, there's two different things we're talking about, height limit and then density control. So most cities across California have density control. So if the density control say you can build 10 units, you can go to the, according to the state law, you can go and uh, say, I'm gonna provide a certain number, let's say one of those 10 units as affordable, and I get a 35% bump bonus. So instead of 10 units, I now can do 13 and a half units, and then they say you can round up, you get 14 units. So that's how it works. You get, get a little bump. Uh, in San Francisco, we have not had a law that really uh, 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 kind of lays out those rules. Uh, developers have not tried to do that, except in a few cases. And in those cases, what the city has done is they've rezoned for some additional density. And affordable housing developers have gotten some of those rezones. It's a very public process, and neighbors can come, and there's a discussion that happens, and so forth. What the city's trying to do is to lay out these rules, <clears throat> and they're putting four different versions before us. So saying, this is one law. One of the versions is how we do the state law. Uh, and it sort of says the developer can apply for this, and we'll do these things and, and give them this bonus in, in exchange. The second version says 
It looks exactly like the first one, except that it says this is automatic. You developer, just come with us rather than saying you have to go through this, this more complicated, uh, I'm going to ask you for this, and then the city comes back and says whether you get it or not or how much. It says, here's a few goodies you get. You get this extra density, and you get a bunch of goodies, less parking or other things. Um, and that's for building, typically for building low-income housing. That's how the state law is, is written. And by low-income housing, I mean in, in the state law, housing for people who make 50% of the median income. 50% of the median income in San Francisco is a family of four, and I always use family of four because it's easy to, to calculate. 50% is a family of four that makes $50,000. So two income earners with two kids, each income earner makes $25,000. That's low-income housing. Um, but the city's not too excited about that, so they came up with a third version, um, which is the city's really excited about middle income housing. So they want to build housing for people who make up to 150% uh, percent of the median income. 150% <clears throat> of the median income. Actually, I'm exaggerating. I think they, they ratcheted down to 140. So 140% of the median income. A family of four that makes $140,000. Or a single person that makes $100,000. Um, so that's in why the family of four isn't actually two people who make $100,000. We can go ask HUD why they came up with those rules. But it's kind of how, how they define it. So if you ever see the city say 140% of median income, you can look it up on the Mayor's Office of Housing has a website. You can look up median incomes. And they change every year. But 140% is a single person who makes $100,000, two people who make a little bit more, three-person household makes a little bit more, four-person household that makes $140,000. The only one I can memorize. My math works out. Um, and then there's a fourth version. Oh, okay. forgot to say this. So this, this third version, among the goodies, you get two additional floors above your height limit. So let's say right here, this is zoned for 10 feet, so this is as high as the ceiling. And we said the zoning, the underlying zoning, said you could build two units. A developer comes in, they can build as many units as they want, two additional floors above this. But in exchange, they have to do 30% of the units with some of them low income and some of them this middle income with 140% of median income. So that's. And, and then the fourth version is if you're building a 100% affordable development, so to our member organization, you get three extra floors. So we should be jumping all over for this and saying this is really great because we get to build three extra floors. And it's actually, it, it is a good thing. Uh, but we worry about what's being given away and, and what we as a public are getting back. For a number of years, my organization, Choo Choo, has, has talked about uh, this idea that we call value capture, or value recapture. Um, planners and policy people, folks at Spur and elsewhere, they're really into trying to say, well, uh, uh, we have too much regulation on developers. We need to get rid of some of these regulations. We need to. Uh, uh, we have these density limits that aren't realistic. You know, I said two units. Maybe you could pack three units here. So why, you know, just Let's get rid of that. Let the market decide. And um, we're not saying that's not necessarily a, that that's necessarily a bad thing. Maybe we do want to have three units here. But once you have three units here, that developer just made profit on one extra unit. Right? So value capture would be, and what are they giving back? What are they giving back to the public in terms of paying for the infrastructure for those those new folks who are living here? or providing some affordable housing that balances that out, or providing other services. So that's where our, my questions come up. Uh, so I just, I try to present, maybe I wasn't as good as the planning department proposal. So, so when they say affordable housing density bonus program, remember it's four different things that they're talking about wrapped up in one law. When they say the state, so that's the first part of the, the question, you will hear the planning department say, this is a requirement because there is a state law. There is one section of what is being proposed that maybe we could say is 
uh, uh, being done to fulfill the requirements of the state law. It's, it's the subsection six of the law. Uh, but these, this other middle income piece, this other piece that says up to two extra stories, the 100% affordable, the affordable housing, that is all something that the city is providing as a benefit to developers that developers can choose to do. Maybe it's a good thing, maybe it's a bad thing. We don't believe that it is required by state law. So that's a good starting point because then we can say we can actually do things differently. The second part is what I said is, then what is the city getting in return for these development bonuses? One of the things about the state law is, we think it's a, it's the state law the way it's written is actually a big giveaway for developers. Mm -hmm. But in fact, there is a, you can measure it mathematically. You can say, in exchange for providing 20% affordable units, the developer gets an extra 35% bonus. So we can go back and see how much profit the developer is getting. In the middle income version that the city is saying, we can't do that math because the way it's written, it simply says, you get rid of density and then you get two extra floors. In our, my first example, when I said this was maybe an RH1, the density here would be one unit and now you can build as many units as you want with two extra floors. If the density was two, now you've gone from two to what you can build with those two extra floors. You can, it, it, it all varies depending on where you're at in the city. And um, we've had some of our developers who work with us look at this and they say, you know, in some parts of the city, this thing isn't gonna work. Nobody's gonna do it. But in other parts of the city, like what just happened on Divisadero, where they rezoned Divisadero, getting rid of density limits on Divisadero was huge huge profit for that developer who's going to build at the Hardy Theater. Because they just went from, I think, was it 16 units to, I forget, it was, it was like a three times as many units that they could build from the previous zoning to the new zoning. And then in addition to that, they said, then you get two extra floors. Um, so that's, that makes it hard to understand because you have to look at every site. There's not a mathematical uh, uh, a way of targeting um, and if you look at the planning department's website, uh, Libby Seifel, who's a consultant who does this, has done this economic study. It's largely incomprehensible. Um, and, and we don't blame her for it being incomprehensible because it is the way the law is written, it's impossible to look at one, do an economic analysis that applies to all the sites under the law because every site is different the way they've written. The third thing is, are they affordable income targets, right? So one of the things that the city has been doing a lot of is saying, this is housing for teachers. Supervisor Kim just said, you know, middle income housing, housing for teachers. Um, so we've had several conversations with the teachers union, with UESF, uh, and we've looked at you know, the income that teachers earn. We think teachers are a good example of the kinds of public uh, uh, professionals who we want to house in this city. Right? and who can't afford to live in the city, and who make more than what, frankly, what our member organizations build. Because we build low-income housing. We do not build middle-income housing. A whole bunch of reasons why not. We don't get, there is no federal money for building middle-income housing. So it's actually a good thing to make the market rate developers build it. So what do teachers earn? Teachers earn uh, about 75% of the median income, or 70% of the median income, to begin with. If you've been teaching in San Francisco for, 10 years, you have tenure, you're in a, uh, what's called category three, which is the higher category of income earning in San Francisco. At most, you would make 90% of the median income. So there ain't no teachers making 140% of median income. <laughs> however, and this gets to question number four, however, if you have two teachers together, so a family of two teachers together, who've been working for 10 years, who are 10 years, and maybe have two kids, they make about 120% of the median income, the way these things are, are worked out. So these income targets look very different when you're talking about a studio from when you're talking about a two bedroom or a three bedroom. A three bedroom for somebody making 140% of median income maybe is two tenured teachers. A studio uh, uh, for somebody making 140% of median, there's no teacher who makes $100,000. Great, they should. 
They deserve $100,000, but you know, that's a different, so, so it's a question. Like, is that who we need to be subsidizing? Maybe, maybe not. Um, and there's, there's a little, uh, I won't get into it, but there's a little uh, 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 table of what different income levels are doing. It's a little bit blurry. We got this off the planning department's website. But basically, what the mayor has said is middle income means the middle. Middle is the median. Half of the people in San Francisco make less than the median, half of the people make more than the median. We get into that's actually wrong. Half the people in San Francisco make less than 90% of the median because our median mm -hmm. includes <laughs> San Mateo and Marin, but that's a whole other question. But more or less, more or less. Half the people make less than the median, half the people make more. That's the definition of, of median. So when we talk about middle income, it means how are we housing everybody who earns from 50% of the median up to 150% of the median. And if we come up with something that only addresses the 150%, we're still leaving everyone else behind. Um, and like I said, our member organizations, we work to house folks from those who are homeless to those who are making 50% of the median, which includes a lot of the workers in our city, people who work in restaurants, people working in hotels. But we do not house, for example, teachers and those who are making more than that. Um, so, Question number four is, will the, family, will the program result in many family units? So the city has recognized that by getting rid of density limits, so again, I said, okay, so this was, as an example, a single family zoning, RH1, you build one family house. If it said you could build two units, you might build two larger units. But if you say to a developer, there's no limit, then the developer's gonna say, how many units can I pack in here? I'm gonna make them as small as possible, as long as I can market it, so it'll be a little back and forth. Well, maybe it needs to be a little bit bigger, but I can put five in here, and uh, with a jacuzzi downstairs, if that's, that'll be the selling point. Um, so the city's kind of recognized this, and they've said, if you take advantage of this program, 40% of the units have to be two bedrooms or larger. Okay, that's a start. Means that if I'm a smart developer, 60% of them will be two units, and then I'll do the 40% that are two bedrooms, and there will be no three bedrooms. So that's the question, right? Is that, and, and again, back to the income discussion, 60% of those units that are studios are going to be marketed, are the, the affordable ones, the ones that get you that bonus, are going to be marketed for people making $100,000, and then the others will be marketed to, God knows what, the market will be. So, that's the question. I'm going to get to the, the, what is to us the heart of it in a moment. Because these are all kind of, I don't know, policy wonky questions. But number five is how does the program address the development review process, right? So um, part of what this program does and, and what's appetizing for developers is to say we're going to bypass how we have traditionally talked about raising height. And if you're going to raise height, you usually go through, when, when we do that, a planning process in the neighborhood. Um, when we haven't done that, there have been those cases where they've done FTDs, which are supposed to be illegal, that we're doing in San Francisco. Um, city's predecessor, Chris Bailey, was famous for doing a few of those, uh, and getting something in return, right? What this does, by laying out this process, is saying that that's out of the picture. We just wrote the rule that just says if you provide the 30% middle income unit, you get two extra floors, and we're done. Um, and in return, they said, well, we're gonna have some design guidelines so that your building looks pretty and not so blocky. Uh, that's a question, right? Because folks are comfortable with that. Question number six is how to increase density, how is this increased density connected to transit and other neighborhood infrastructure? So in Market Octavia and in the Eastern neighborhoods, which were both rezoned in 2008, 2010, they're about Developers were allowed to build extra density. Actually, it's density, we got rid of density. And in, but instead, we applied impact fees on those developments to help offset the cost of new transit, new open space, new parks, new childcare centers. This program applies everywhere else and doesn't have those fees. So how are we gonna deal with that infrastructure? It's a question. Uh, I think the previous speaker who was here talked about um, the, the changes to the L line. That maybe that's how you're gonna deal with the new uh, uh, infrastructure, and as you heard, there's problems there, right? 
Um, but I think, but for us as an affordable housing organization, question number seven is what is the, to us the biggest sticking point. Mm -hmm. Anytime you're creating an incentive, and, and the city wants this to be an incentive, they want developers to take advantage of it, the question is, well, what's there already? And if what's already there is rent-controlled housing with residents living in that housing, should we be creating an incentive um, to demolish those buildings and create these new units, even if they have some affordability to them? And that's to us, I think, our, our, our starting point is that this should not apply where we have rent-controlled housing. Um, if you look at the city's, the staff report for it, they, they imagine that they can uh, incentivize and can get up to 16,000 new units built through this program. And they did that by looking at what they call soft sites. Soft sites is a term that planners use for something that has maybe a one-story building or a parking lot, an old uh, uh, gas station, or something like that. And so for us, well, that's fine. If that's, if that's the study that you started with, then let's just take out everything that has residential buildings on them, and you're still going to be able to accomplish what you're trying to do. And we've got all these other questions we've got to deal with. Um, so that's the housing part. The second one is, um, as affordable housing developers, when we build with federal money uh, where there are neighborhood services and retail, we have to deal with what happens with that retail. And oftentimes, it's not pretty. Uh, uh, retailers can't survive a relocation. But the federal government requires that if we're receiving money through this thing called the Uniform Act, we pay for the relocation of whoever is on that site, including the tenant improvements that they would need to, to have. And we think that something like that, because it's an incentive program, so we're, we're trying to create more profit for developers, should be a starting point. Um, because I mean, if their version has their little map and says it, the, the map that they show uh, of where they want this to apply is primarily on um, uh, uh, the commercial corridors in the west side of the city, as well as the entire, a lot of District 2 and a lot of District 5. But mostly in the out, out, out west side of the city is along the commercial corridors. And indeed, there is very little housing exactly on those corridors, and maybe that is where it makes sense to build more housing. But if you're going to do that, again, what's going to happen to the businesses that are there baseline for make it work. So number seven that I, that I end with is really kind of, as, as Choo Choo, our starting point uh, for our position on this. And uh, hopefully that might, might help open discussions and open for questions. It's been heard three times now as an informational item. If I confused you about, about what this thing does, planning staff has confused their own planning commission three times. <laughs> they keep asking them to come back to explain the thing over and over again. Uh, so they wanted to vote on it this last Thursday. It's not going to be voted on now until January 28th as a planning commission. Um, and uh, it's, their answers, the staff's answers to their commissioners have gotten better, but they haven't really changed proposal as it, as it was introduced. Um, hopefully before January 28th, they will begin to, to make some of those changes. So if, if I understand correctly, in yep. January 28th, the, uh, the Planning Commission will define details for implementing the state program, basically. And then that, so that's, that's one of the four parts of this law, that the Planning Commission will be asked to vote on the entire density bonus program, which is really four programs and it will then be forwarded to the, uh, the Board of Supervisors. So since, uh, my real question is, since this is so complicated, it really is, yes. and my general sense is it varies very much from site to yes. site and building to building, will your group, which is knowledgeable, come up with recommendations between now and when the Board yeah. of Supervisors, so to, to, to sort of control it? Yeah, so we're working on those, on those right now. We'll probably uh, come together as an organization in, in mid-January with a statement. Um, but the first statement that we're going to do for sure uh, with our, uh, we're also part of a group called the San Francisco Anti-Displacement Coalition, which is a lot of the tenant organizations, is to say at minimum this should not apply where there are rent control buildings. So that's, that's going to be our first choice. Now we're working on answers to each of these questions. The question number three then, like how much, 
how much do developers get out of it, it is impossible to analyze because of how it's written. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, uh, now, there are some maps I unfold from the 80s or something that show subterranean rivers and things. Uh, uh, there, you know, there's something like supposed to be underneath the opera house. Mm -hmm. You know, and that people, you know, that, that maybe some of these developers haven't looked at or would like to disregard. Mm -hmm. And you know, in subsoil, sub underneath, the, you know, what we have here mm -hmm. is earthquake country, and we have sub whatever it's called. Yep, rivers. No, the developer thought is as long as it flies for 10 years, when the homeowner association can't sue them anymore, <laughs> they're good. I mean, that's and that's that's been city policy. I mean, what's this is an entirely different different item, but you know, as 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 sea levels rise, most of Mission Bay, most of Treasure Island, um, most of the shipyard is going to be underwater unless major dikes are built to protect those areas. Yeah. Development, just like the previous speaker talking about, you know, how PTX is being planned or not planned. You know, developers are just moving right on ahead, uh, mm -hmm. I guess, praying that, you know, mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. somewhere, somewhere, mm -hmm. someone, yeah. The only thing I can see is about about the people that oppose build, building the Byzantine, but the thing is, that's what kept the city livable. <laughs> You know, and I, and I wouldn't, you know, I, I, we're not opposed to, to this in concept. And that's, that's, I mean, part of what's difficult about this is that we actually believe that bringing more density, if it is balanced with affordable housing, if it is balanced with infrastructure, is actually a good thing in some parts, as long as you're not displacing people, as long as you're dealing with ha the impacts on businesses. Mm -hmm. We think it's a good thing. Uh, unfortunately, you know, we're working on driving this, so. <laughs> 